Hello, everyone. And now we're moving on to water and wastewater chemistry. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a really basic review of some chemistry terms as well as some basic biology. And we're all going to look at it in terms of how it will help us to purify and to treat both our drinking water supply as well as our wastewater supply. So looking at our objectives today, the four things that we'd like to do. First, we're going to identify typical microorganisms and pathogens in a water system. And again, water system is any type of system, be it drinking water, a waterway, or wastewater. Then we're going to determine the importance of dissolved oxygen and why it's needed for microorganisms and, and healthy aquatic life to grow. Then we're going to define oxygen demand. And again, this is how much oxygen is needed in order to break down organic material, which is a process all different organisms do. And then finally, we're going to calculate the amount of oxygen needed to decompose uh, organic matter using either a theoretical or measurable method. And there's multiple measurable methods, but we're going to discuss three of them today. We're going to go back and do a little bit of biology. So again, going back, the cell is what's considered the basic structural unit. And this is for all living organisms. And this was discovered by Robert Hooke in 1665. Now, the two types of uh, structural cells that I'd like to look at are the prokaryote and the eukaryote. The prokaryote is a very basic organism because it lacks both a nucleus and organized cell structure, which we call it lacks organelles. So as you can see, a prokaryote is essentially just a cell membrane with a general area, which is the nucleoid. And everything within the cell performs all of the functions. They're not designated functions. Second, the eukaryote. The eukaryote is different in that it contains what we call membrane-bound compartments, essentially what you would say in your system, such as organs, where they each perform specific metabolic activities. So just like your heart performs a certain activity versus your digestive tract versus, say, your lungs, they each have their own function that help you survive. So if you notice with a eukaryote, a eukaryote also has a cell membrane. But as you can see, it has a defined nucleus, the nucleolus, the, nucleo, uh, the nucleus, and the mitochondrion. Again, these all serve different functions. And they also have ribosomes. Something to keep in mind, a eukaryote, which is a more complex structure, is approximately one millimeter in length or in diameter. This is something that you can see with the naked eye. So if you ever take out a ruler and look at one millimeter, that's something that you can measure. However, a prokaryote is about a thousand times smaller than that. So it's not something that you would see with the naked eye. Neither would you see a virus. So these are three different types of biological systems that we'll be talking about. And again, some are what we call good different types of organisms, and others are considered harmful to humans and other types of animals. So let's talk a little bit more about microorganisms. Microorganisms, like we said, can be helpful or hurtful to humans. Obviously, the helpful different type of microorganisms we do want. And those are organisms such as bacteria that make cheeses or can then produce medicines such as penicillin. And we can even use helpful organisms to break down and treat our wastewater. So we can remove both some of our solid organic material as well as some of the hurtful microorganisms in our wastewater system. But in order to do that, and again, here's an example of what we call a digester. This is at the Newtown Creek, very similar. So that's something that we may go see as part of one of our field trips. This is very similar to the digestive tract in a human being. And in order to have the system to break down organic material, you often need certain temperature ranges depending on the type of the microorganism. So the first one is called a psychrophil. And that grows typically at what we would call lower temperatures, meaning less than 68 degrees Fahrenheit. This would be a temperature range that's much lower than the human system. Where a mesophyll is con considered more of a medium temperature range from the 68 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is what we would say mimics more of a human system. And this is most often used when we treat our wastewater. 
Also, this is the reason why is this range of temperatures, again, the 68 to 104, is very natural that we would find in most, um, most inhabited areas on the planet. Again, not considering the extremes such as the poles or maybe say, some really heavily tropical areas. So this is good because we can use the natural temperature to treat the, our wastewater and we don't have to heat or cool the system and that saves energy. A thermophil, so when you think of thermo, think of heat, these are typically growing organisms in hotter temperatures, we'll say from 104 to 158. And then last but not least, a hypothermophil grows best in extreme temperatures, greater than 158 degrees Fahrenheit. But again, if I can have you just remember for the sake of this, typically we're going to work in the mesophil range because of the temperature range. So again, just important to note. Now we talked about good organisms, again, that help us create foods, medicines, and even treat wastewater. However, there are some bad organisms, and again we say this bad in the sense that because they're called pathogens, and pathogens cause disease or illness in their host. Now this depends on the type of organism. Not all microorganism is harmful to humans, so it's just the ones that are, are concerned to us so that if we ingest the hormone, uh, not the pathogen, we are concerned about different types of diseases. The four that I'd ask you to consider, we're just going to talk about them and identify them now. We'll talk about them in more detail when we talk about drinking water and wastewater. We'll point them out specifically. But again, we're going to be concerned about viruses, specific types of bacteria, specific types of protozoa, and specific types of helminths. If you'd like, and again, I, this is a video I'll probably refer back to later on, cryptosporidium was a type of uh, bacteria, if I remember correctly, and if you want to see a very quick video, this just sort of talks about how a, the outbreak of crypt cryptosporidium affected many people in our country in the 1980s, and it was once we learned that, that we now will test to make sure that we don't have that in our water supply. Now we talked about the different types of microorganisms and pathogens. In order for organisms to survive, they have to break down organic material. So again, think of it as food. They have to digest their food. In order to do that, you need dissolved oxygen. So what is the purpose of dissolved oxygen? You have to make sure you have enough in a, in a water system so that you maintain a healthy aquatic environment. So again, dissolved oxygen are like those, you almost want to consider them small oxygen bubbles, and many times they're microscopic. So you want to make sure that you have enough oxygen for the fish and other aquatic life to survive in the water. Also, you want to make sure that there's enough uh, oxygen so that you can decompose organic matter, say, in a wastewater system. So again, these two are essentially the same purpose. The first, you want enough oxygen in a natural waterway. Second, you want enough dissolved oxygen in a treatment system. Now the question is, how much? So we'll start talking about that eventually. But the amount of dissolved oxygen depends on what different types of, of scenarios or different types of conditions. So you need to be concerned about temperature. You need to consider salinity. So again, the, more, the, the saltier the water source, again, that will affect how much oxygen is needed to break down your organic matter the altitude, the microbe type, so again, what organism is trying to break down the, the organic material, and what is the nature of the organic material. We'll talk about more about organic material in a moment, but again, these are some of our concerns that you need to consider. Now, waterways are monitored constantly for the amount of dissolved oxygen that is present. If the if we water source is saturated with oxygen, that's the best scenario you can have. So 100% saturation is great. If there's very little oxygen present or those levels tend to go down, that means there's not enough oxygen for the marine life that's in the waterway. So I'd like to show you very briefly, this is an example of real-time water data from the United States Geological Survey. This is a government agency that has stations throughout the country at different waterways and they monitor the quality of our lakes and rivers. So I'm going to insert a new page here.
and I'll take an image from the website. Let's see. Give me just a second here to do that. You can bring that to you. Unfortunately, it's on my slides are shown there. So let's see if I can give you one more better take on that. There we go. That's a little bit better to see. So this is actually from the USGS website. And the one that I'd like to point out, there's some of the, here's some data from the Ramapo River at Doors Highway in Pompton, New Jersey. Also, the Passaic River below Pompton River at two bridges in New Jersey. If you look, this is the amount of dissolved oxygen in the waterway in milligrams per liter. So in the Ramapo, it's 13.2 at this time. And in the Passaic River at the station that's given, it's 13.3. Why is that important? Again, these values are wonderful to see because if you look at the dissolved oxygen percent saturation, that means the waterway is 100 percent saturated. That means all of the oxygen that could possibly be in that waterway is available to the aquatic life. So this gives a, a, the impression that it's a very healthy system. If you notice that there's a section where it says the right intake, it's dropped quite a bit, about 86 percent. That means it might be more of a stagnant area with low velocity. And if that's the case, oftentimes fish will go there to hide or to find prey. So that might be an area where there's more activity and more oxygen is used. So again, that's something that they would monitor. Now we talked also about, again, going back to our, some of our terms, we talked about temperature. So I'd like to show you a, a slide that talks about the relationship between dissolved oxygen and temperature. So the question I'm asking here, what do you notice about the concentration of dissolved oxygen and seasonal temperature? So if you notice the black line as part of our scatter plot here is the concentration of dissolved oxygen, while the blue shows the water temperature. And you can see how it varies by season. Hopefully you notice that there's an inverse relationship. Notice that the dissolved oxygen is high in the winter when the water temperature is lower. While in the summer months, the water temperature is higher, but the dissolved oxygen is lower. The best way to describe that, this, is all par this all belongs to the partial pressure law, which essentially states that as temperature goes up, fluids move more towards a gaseous state and rise. So if you think about it, the best way you can think of this practically if you've ever opened a soda or any type of carbonated beverage in the summer, you notice it goes flat a lot faster. And the reason why is with the higher temperatures, the gas bubbles readily move from the liquid into the atmosphere and rise. So again, that's why your soda goes flat in the summer and not as quickly in the winter. And it has to do with the temperature to gas ratio, which in this case, case is the dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen also directly affects the aquatic environment, which we've mentioned before. But how so? Now, say a wastewater treatment plant is treating wastewater, so again, it's treating it in the plant, and then suddenly releases it into an aquatic environment. Well, when you release treated organic material, it's going to be broken down and oxygen is going to be used. Now, if too much oxygen is used in a system, that means there's no oxygen available for other aquatic organisms such as fish or lobsters or any type of aquatic plant life. This point where you reach the critical two parts per million for dissolved oxygen is known as the sad time. So this is the amount of time it takes to reach the minimum amount of oxygen in a waterway. This is also part of what we call a septic zone, where only certain types of organisms can live in that type of environment. 
such as fungus, sludge, worms, and bacteria. And this is because these type of organisms can, can survive on anaerobic respiration, meaning oxygen is absent. We'll talk a bit more about respiration and organic material in just a moment. Now what happens is as the system starts to recover, and say fresh water moves into the system, say in a river, more oxygen comes into the system, which will allow the organic material to be, continue to be consumed. The organic material will reach a minimum. More fresh oxygen will come in, reach the healthy level of eight parts per million, and then you will see other aquatic life come back, such as trout, bass, and other types of fish. So again, it's really critical to have a healthy amount of dissolved oxygen in your waterway. So what's an example of, say, a septic zone? What does a septic zone look like? Here's an example. And you've probably seen this before with certain waterways. This is also known as one example of a septic system comes from eutrophication. And what happens is when you put back into a system, so again, say if you treat water, or maybe you have soil that has a large amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon, what happens is that's an excellent food source for algae. So algae use that as a food source plus the organic matter coming in, and they convert both the organic material, the, not, not yet, excuse me, they, they convert the nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon, and use light energy, and convert that into carbon dioxide and water using the process of photosynthesis. That, the, that, that process of photosynthesis and the food source that the algae have causes them to reproduce and you get a system where that is just overflowing with algae. The algae consume all of the oxygen and when you use all of the oxygen you get this eutrophication to occur. Now when that happens essentially there's no oxygen left for any other organisms so what you'll actually see is a large amount of aquatic life will die off because of that. So that's something we as engineers need to make sure we, we monitor the health of a waterway to make sure there's enough oxygen for all of the aquatic life and not just the algae. Some terms we started to talk about but we didn't define them as much. We didn't define what organic matter is considered. Organic matter is any sort of uh, living organism or material that contains carbon. So again, the key term is carbon. Now, organic material can be found in our wastewater and drinking water in the form of feces, leaves, roots, and food waste. It's part of our job as engineers to remove that organic material so that we can have water that's safe to drink and safe to use. But how we remove it depends on three different types of methods. So, we can often use um, good bacteria or good microorganisms to break down the organic matter and remove it from the system so that we can purify our water. Our first method we could use is an aerobic decomposition, which has aerobic respiration where the organisms break down the organic material using oxygen. That's very common. Or we can have an anoxic decomposition where we have anoxic respiration by the microorganisms to break down material if oxygen is absent. Or you can have anaerobic decomposition where you break down material with microorganisms when there's low oxygen and it's not necessary because the organisms don't require oxygen at all. So again, depending on what type of system you have, you will look for a certain method of decomposition. Now, oftentimes, one of our more popular ones is, aero is aerobic decomposition, using oxygen and breaking down materials that contain the carbon. So, how can you do that? How can you determine how much oxygen you need in order to properly break down organic material or to have a healthy aquatic environment? Well, the first method you can use is theoretical in which case you calculate using the atomic weight of the different organic substances the amount of oxygen you need to break it down into carbon dioxide and water. Again, this is a theoretical method and an 
Unfortunately, what's the downside of it is you aren't always able to account for all of the different variables. But usually, you can get um, a very good value just to, as a, a starting point. Or you can use measurable means, which means you actually take samples of water that have organic material in it, put microorganisms into the sample, and see how much oxygen they consume. So again, this is a very practical method. So you can either do that using biochemical, meaning using actual organisms as the method, or you can use chemicals so you would have your organic material, you would add chemicals, and then you would see how much oxygen in the water is used to break down that organic material. These are definitely the more common ways to go, simply because this is how we will break down material in a wastewater system. So what I'd like to do is my goal is to do one example of theoretical oxygen demand and an example of biochemical oxygen demand. Of the two, biochemical is very common because it's a natural system. So we'll do quite a bit on biochemical oxygen demand, or BOD. So example number one is the theoretical oxygen demand. So theoretical oxygen demand represents the ideal oxygen consumption. Again, the actual, act the actual amount of oxygen consumed depends on how easy it is to grade that substance or the organism that is doing the metabolizing, which is actually consuming that substance. So oftentimes, there's many different variables you need to consider. But like I said, it represents an ideal value, and it gives you a starting point. What I'll be referring to, if you want to have up the PowerPoint and the, the video side by side, is I'll be referring to the periodic table of elements for atomic weight. That's the next slide on this video. So I'll be going back and forth to those. But the three that you'll want to consider in particular, and I'll circle them for you, just to find a color that works. Okay. We'll be looking at carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. So we'll need the atomic weight of these three. So in order to solve the problem, essentially we're going to look at ratios. How much oxygen is needed per, of, in milligrams per liter compared to how much glucose we're trying to break down? So here's an example. Example number one says, determine the theoretical oxygen demand needed to oxidize 300 milligrams per liter of glucose, which is C6H12O6, probably many of you remember that from biology or chemistry, given the oxidation equation is glucose plus six double molecules or double bonded molecules of oxygen will yield six carbon dioxide molecules, and six water molecules. So let's look at what the, the, the total concentrations of oxygen and car, uh, glucose are, and let's see if we can work out a ratio. So first, let me start first with the glucose. So first we're going to determine say atomic weight. That's so we can determine their concentration. So first with the glucose, we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The carbon has six molecules. The hydrogen has 12 molecules and the oxygen has six. So we want to multiply that by their atomic weight. So let's look real quick. Going to our periodic table, carbon, and I do apologize, it's very hard to see. You might want to zoom in if need be. Carbon has an atomic weight of approximately 12. Oxygen has an atomic weight of approximately 16. And hydrogen has an approximate atomic weight of one. We'll use that information in our problem. So again, we said carbon has an atomic weight of 12. Grab my pen here. Hydrogen has an atomic weight of 1. 
and oxygen has an atomic weight of 16. So let's find out what the total atomic weight is. So we have 72, 12, and 96. That gives us a total of 180 to the atomic mass. Now let's do that for the oxygen as well so we can see what the ratio needed is. We know we have 300 milligrams per liter of glucose, so again we want to see how, does, how much would we need to oxidize the oxygen. So we have for our oxygen, we're working only with oxygen molecules of which there are 12, because again, just to point out, you have six double bonds, so it's a total of 12 molecules, and oxygen has an atomic weight of 16. That gives us 192. So notice the glucose has an atomic weight of 180, oxygen has an atomic weight of 192, so it's actually more. So now that we've determined the atomic weight, for step two, let's determine concentration of the oxygen needed. Looks like I'm a little delayed with my writing here. Concentration, there we are. So what's the ratio? We, the ratio of oxygen to glucose And we want to multiply that by the concentration of, and again, this is just a simple ratio, times the ratio of glucose, which is 300 milligrams per liter. So if that's the case, we have oxygen with an atomic number of 192, glucose with an atomic number of 180, times a concentration of 300 milligrams per liter. Again, all this originally was is a ratio of atomic num oxygen to glucose equals oxygen to glucose. So we did atomic number to atomic number, concentration to concentration. And my numbers are a little bit squished, but hopefully you get a concentration of 321 milligrams per liter. So you need 321 milligrams for every liter of water of oxygen in order to break down the glucose and oxidize it into carbon dioxide and water. So again, that, that would be the theoretical oxygen demand. Now we've talked about the theoretical. Let's talk a little bit about the measurable means. Again, the first being the biochemical oxygen demand. What it asks you to do, and again, just to do this as a quick two-minute video, it talks about how you would gather a sample to measure biochemical oxygen demand. So take a moment, pause the video, but make sure you think what the answer is for these three questions. What safety gear are they wearing? How long is the sample stored in a dark place? Be sure to remove all what completely before capping the sample tube so that the additional oxygen is not present. So I'll give you a moment to pause, and then we'll resume. Now, after watching the video, you want to focus on the fact that they're wearing safety gear, particularly because if you're collecting a sample, your sample may have pathogens in it. And again, you don't know what types of microorganisms you have. Some are good, some are bad. So you just want to make sure that you're protected. Second, you want to make sure you store the sample for five days in a dark place. And we'll explain why. And finally, when you cap your sample, again, the one that's shown here is actually not a good sample because there should be no air present. 
you want to make sure you remove all the air so that you don't introduce additional photosynthesis. Again, photosynthesis requires um, additional oxygen. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You, pu you put it in a dark place so that you don't have photosynthesis. But you want to remove additional oxygen that might be present in air. So you fill the entire sample so that you don't have air um, contaminating part of your, your test. So this is a brief rundown of how you would measure the amount of oxygen needed using biological systems. So again, the, the system essentially looks like this. These are your samples that you've collected water. So again, you typically make sure you fill it to overflowing. These are approximately 300 milliliter samples. This is the, the typical volume that's used. And then the five-day value, which we will get to, is what you're measuring. So how do you measure the BOD over uh, the five days? Well, first, you need a source of organisms, organisms that will um, break down the organic matter. The organisms can either be taken from, say, a waterway, so again, if you're testing to see if there are any organisms present, or you can take it from what we call an activated sludge system, which essentially means you remove good bacteria from a wastewater treatment system. And what that does is that provides the organisms to eat your organic material. So then you get a water sample which has organic material in it. You place it in a, um, a dark location for five days at a constant temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit with the microorganisms added in so that they can consume the organic material. And in the process, they also use oxygen. At the end of the five days, you measure how much oxygen remains. So again, first you test to find out how much oxygen is present before you take the test. And then you see how much oxygen remains. And that tells you how much oxygen was used. The reason why we use five days, which we call the BOD5, so if you were to plot the amount of oxygen used over time, you would see that it's an exponential curve, and it's a negative exponential curve. The reason why the test is for five days is it gives you a good sense of the amount of oxygen that's needed over a short period of time. And this is what we call the BOD5, or the five-day BOD. And one of the reasons we use this is that the five-day value is when only organic matter is oxidized at that time. Where the ultimate BOD, if we follow the curve, is essentially where the curve reaches equilibrium. So again, it starts to plateau. And this is where no more carbon is break broken down. This is an equilibrium position. This secondary curve also contains a nitrogen breakdown. So again, we're not considering that. We're only concerned about curve A, which is an a exponential curve and it's only of carbon breaking down. So how would you determine the BOD concentration for five days? Again, it's essentially a ratio. Again, you look at what was the initial oxygen concentration when you started, what was the final oxygen concentration after five days, and the test is standardized based on 300 milliliter samples. So what you do is you take a ratio of the volume of your sample that you use and compare it to 300 milliliters. Typical test results, if, assuming you have a 300 milliliter sample, if the BOD5 is less than 2 milligrams per liter, typically you get rid of it. And the reason why, that means that there's a very small amount of oxygen present and most likely anaerobic uh, decomposition or anaerobic respiration occurred, which means the test is not even valid because the material is being broken down by organisms that don't even need oxygen. So it's a, a test that's, that's invalid. Now, if it turned out that the BOD5 is greater than 7 milligrams per liter for a 300 milliliter sample, 
we still disregard it typically because most likely air got into the sample. And if air got into the sample, which is highly concentrated with oxygen, it's a false reading. So again, for a 300 milliliter sample, you don't need to dilute it because that's the standard value. And typically, you'll see a range of 0 to 7. But like we said, we'll, we typically disregard values below 2 and above 7. And if you want to scale your test based on the amount of sample present, these are the anticipated ranges for the BOD in milligrams per liter. So if that's the case, let's try to calculate a BOD concentration. So the question says, Determine the BOD5 if the initial concentration is 250, 255 milligrams per liter, and the final concentration is 250 milligrams per liter, and the volume of the sample is 100 milliliters. Now keep in mind, 100 milliliters is less than the standard value, so you would need to scale it. Is the sample valid, or should it be disregarded? So for step number one, first, Let's determine the BOD5. So again, the BOD5 is equal to the initial concentration, which is 255 milligrams per liter, minus the final concentration, which is 250 milligrams per liter. And we have to scale our ratio based on the 100 milliliters that we have compared to the 300 milliliters of a standard sample. Take a moment, try to calculate it. If you need to pause, please do. Hopefully you got a concentration of 15 milligrams per liter. Is that valid? So for question number two, Is it valid? Well, let's see. If we go back to our table just before, I'll grab my highlighter. Our sample was a 100 milliliter sample, and the anticipated range should be between 6 and 21. So in that sense, yes, we'll say that it is a valid sample. Sorry, going back to my, my problem here. So is it valid? Yes, because 6 milliliters, or 6 milligrams per liter, excuse me, is less than or equal to 15 milligrams per liter, which is less than or equal to 21 milligrams per liter. So perfect. So now that we have that, let's move on and talk about another term, which was the ultimate BOD. And again, we talked about that just for a moment. And we said that when the curve or the amount of oxygen starts to reach an equilibrium, meaning no more oxygen is being used or, or no more carbon is being broken down, this is known as the ultimate value. So it's that essentially at what time, meaning in how many, typically in how many days, does it take to reach that ultimate concentration or ultimate oxygen demand? So the ultimate BOD is again an exponential equation. So notice it's a negative exponential because we have a plateau as opposed to a positive exponential which ramps up. What do each of the terms stand for? The BOD T stands for the BOD at any specific time. Usually we start with the five day value that we've tested and gotten the concentration for so that we can find some of our other values. Again, the ultimate BOD is the value of equilibrium so that we can project, project out at what time will we reach our equilibrium position. K prime is the reaction rate coefficient. And again, this depends on multiple different variables. So often this is determined in the laboratory. K, so K prime sub R is the reaction rate coefficient at 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius, so standard value, which is what we'll use in the next problem. There's a temperature coefficient if you shift from the standard range of 68 Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius, and then the actual temperature of the sample. 
So again, let's try example number three, which is again a BOD concentration. It says determine the concentration of the ultimate BOD based on a BOD five-day test. The BOD5 sample had a concentration of 160 milligrams per liter at 20 degrees Celsius. That's good to know because that's the standard temperature. So you don't have to uh, alter your K prime value. It says assume a reaction rate coefficient of K prime equal to 0.21 per day. So again, since the K prime value is tested at 20 degrees Celsius, you don't have to alter it. Secondly, we're asked to determine the concentration of biochemical oxygen demand at three days for the same sample. So let's do step number one. So first we are asked to determine the BOD ultimate. And I'm going to go right into the equation. So the BOD ultimate is equal to the BOD5 concentration, which is 160 milligrams per liter divided by the exponential equation which is 1 minus e to the negative k which is 0.21 per day multiplied by 5 days because that's the value of the BOD value. Days and days cancel. And if you do your calculation, hopefully you get a value of 246 milligrams per liter. So that's the concentration of oxygen used, so that's the oxygen required after five days. Now, excuse me, no, not after five days, excuse me. That's the amount of oxygen required at equilibrium. So that's our ultimate value. So O2 needed. for equilibrium. Now, using that information, let's calculate the BOD3. Now, notice with our equation here, the BOD ultimate is a standard, or I shouldn't say standard, but constant value. Again, it's more an equilibrium value. What typically will change is the BOD at a certain time, and again, that time is listed here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for BOD at three days. So my equation gets rearranged such that the BOD3 is equal to the BOD ultimate multiplied by 1 minus E to the minus K prime T. So solving for BOD3, Again, we just found our ultimate BOD to be 246 milligrams per liter. Multiply that by 1 times E to the 0 0.21 day. Now times 3 days. Again, our days and days cancel. If you calculate that, you should get approximately 115 milligrams per liter. So that's how much oxygen is needed at day three. So now if you notice, we've spoken about the theoretical oxygen demand. We've now done one of the measurable types of oxygen demand calculations, which is the biochemical oxygen demand. Our last type of oxygen demand is chemical oxygen demand. So again, this is a measurable method to determine the amount of oxygen needed to break down organic material. So chemical oxygen demand, instead of using um, organisms, uses chemicals to break down the amount of organic material. So again, the highlight is that we're using chemicals instead of organisms to break down waste or organic material. What is ideal is typically, the chemical oxygen demand turns out to be 95 to 100 percent of the theoretical oxygen demand. So it's, it's a very efficient way to break down waste. Also another benefit is that the chemical oxygen demand 
can break down organics, organics even faster than the biological oxygen demand. So the question would say, why would you choose even to use the biochemical oxygen demand? Well, the reason why is because it's a natural system. If you don't have to add additional chemicals, if you can grow and maintain good bacteria or good organisms, then you have your source. You have your source that will break down your waste for you, where chemicals cost money and have to be constantly purchased and added. Now, if you go the chemical oxygen demand route, you, the two typical chemicals that you use are either potassium permanganate, which is seen here, it looks more like a black type of chemical in its dry form, or potassium dichromate, which seen here is typically red in dry form. These chemicals are often used and added to a wastewater treatment system to break down your organic matter. The question should be, well, which method do you use? Do you use biochemical or do you use a chemical treatment? It depends on what's available. If the theoretical oxygen demand is very high, meaning that you have a large amount of organic material, however, there isn't a lot of or oxygen available, so again, think that there's really nothing to break it down, then that means you need chemicals in order to break down your waste. Where instead, if it's calculated that the theoretical oxygen demand is high, meaning there's a lot of organic material to be broken down, and there's a large amount of oxygen present, well, then you can use biological treatment. That's often how it's chosen. So very often we use the theoretical oxygen demand to determine what we need, how much oxygen, and then the, depending on your system, whether you have available to you a large amount of organisms that can break it down, or if not, you use chemicals. So that brings us to the end of our objectives. So what do you need to do? Please make sure you do quiz number five before the deadline. Please review and start homework number five, which is your HECGRAS model. Notice that homework number five is a continuation of last week's lecture. It has nothing to do with um, biochemical oxygen demand, chemical oxygen demand, or theoretical. It's a continuation of last week. Last week, you did by hand, you were given a bulk of the information for cross-section number one, which you had to finish, and then by hand, you were calculating the water surface profile for cross-section number two. To now for homework number five, as you can probably have guessed if you've already done homework number four, doing the hand calculations for the standard step method is very time consuming. That's why it's very useful to have a tool such as HECRAS, which if you input your information for cross-section 1, 2, 3, and 4, as well as some other flow information, within a matter of seconds, you can get all of the water surface profiles, which are shown here. So that's your charge for next week. If you don't remember how to use HECRAS, or I recommend you just download it anyway and follow along with it, I included your lab number 10 from food mechanics from your previous semesters. And the reason why is it goes through all of the different screens that you would need to do for homework number five. So it's a good guide as to how you should go about the problem. So with that, please feel free to email me with any questions. Otherwise, thank you.